putting this one onto the negative of this battery, mm -hmm. I put this one directly to the metal of the engine. Now directly why? onto the metal. What's ah. the point of that? Well, the point of that is this. If I put this negative one onto this battery, then I drain the energy from this good battery into this bad battery, and I'll bring them both down to a low common denominator, whereby this battery will get a little bit better, but not as much as it could be. So a lot of the energy from this battery is wasted just filling this one up, and it will not give it up to the starter motor. So I'm using this full battery to energize that starter motor, bypassing the flat battery. Okay. And that's the important point to remember. This way, the starter motor will turn much faster and much better. So what do I do now? Do I just start my car? Now you go and start your car. And this car doesn't have to be running? Yes, it's very important. It's a good point to make. This car must be running. And preferably, if somebody is with you doing it, allow it to what we call fast idle. Just slightly faster running than at idle speed. You know, about, say, a quarter throttle. So that there's a good lot of energy coming from the alternator of this car into this battery, giving your car a good firm start. Now, before we see if the cars are actually going to start, Gerard, have you got any gadgets for us this week? Well, yeah, whilst we're talking about flat batteries, I thought this one would be a nice one. It's fresh on the market. It's called ah. the a solar panel. And uh, via the cigar lighter socket, it allows you to charge up your battery with a very small charge. It's particularly handy, for example, if you left your car at the airport for four or five days, then you know that when you come back, the battery will still be nicely topped up. Um, also, it, for example, would be very useful on a boat. One wonders whether it would work in this country with this weather. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as long as it doesn't rain too much. Yeah. All right, well, let's do what we've got to do, and that is see if the cars start, Gerard. Good. simple suggestions before you call in the experts. Well now, next time we'll be showing you how to wash and clean your car the professional way. Until then, safe driving. And those tips can be learned at the same time tomorrow. An animated Christmas on BBC Two. Wonderful things, these techno trousers. Oh, I'm sorry. Wallace and Gromit are back, but a pilfering penguin has a sinister plan for Wallace's latest invention. Whoa! It's the wrong trousers, Gromit, and they've gone wrong. Help me, Gr Gromit! And a shortage of cheese leads to a grand day out. Everybody knows the moon's made of cheese. Bill of Nick Park celebrated animations for Christmas Day and Christmas Sunday on BBC Two. Chris Jarvis will be opening up Children's BBC in half an hour, and today he has the brollies. Animal Passions now on BBC Two with the fostering of an Australian grey headed flying fox. We love you. This is 21, is that transmission? That's right, the transmission is video. Do I have a wire to go? Got titles off Del 1, mixing through to camera 3. You can you stand by to record, please, Gus? We'll send your bars in tone. Standing by. Standing by. Stand by and roll to record. Hi, can you get yeah, two of those cameras? Right, thanks. 10 seconds. 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one. Richard Moorcroft for ABC News. In South Korea, six policemen have been injured in a confrontation with students at... How's the baby? How's that little one? Jeez, <laughs> we just feel him wriggling up. He's waking up a bit. Do you want to have a look? Oh, I'd love to, yeah. yeah. There's a small, furry animal wrapped up in a handkerchief <laughs> keeping warm inside my shirt. People are often very curious about this rather strange baby. 
something and else. she knows just starting to move on to little bits of uh, minced up apple but still mainly milk at the stage mm. it's all part of raising a little orphan i've called archie This is a young grey-headed flying fox which came from a colony not very far from Sydney. His mother died and uh, so I'm the new foster parent for a few months. <laughs> what we're hoping is that eventually he will be able to rejoin the colony and get back into the wild. But in the meantime, you need a lot of looking after, don't you? In fact, in the meantime, you need a good feed. Come on. Come on, let go. When they're very young, they need a lot of attention. They have to have nappies changed, their fur cleaned, and be wrapped up as they would be in their mother's wings. Most people know me as a newsreader, but I'm also a volunteer member of WIRES, the Wildlife Information and Rescue Service, which is how I came to foster this little orphan. The milk formula that I'm using is a special one for flying foxes and it has to be given in carefully measured quantities. Remember when it used to go in just an eye dropper? That's it. Okay, have you had enough now? I think you have because that's all there is. There we go. Oh! That's okay, you can have your dummy back. Here you go. In the wild, it would hang on to its mother's nipple even when it wasn't actually feeding, so the dummy gives it a good sense of security. I love the bush, and I love its wildlife, but like so many Australians, I live where I work, in the city, and in my case, that's Sydney. It's hard to believe that only a couple of hundred years ago, this whole area was covered in a huge eucalyptus forest. Most of it's been cleared and covered with roads and houses. Only a few pockets of bushland survive. Only a dozen kilometres or so from the centre of the city is a particular tree-filled valley. And that valley is the home of a colony of grey-headed flying foxes. This is almost certainly the colony in which this young flying fox that I'm fostering was born because it's the only major colony left really close to Sydney. Uh, at various times of the year there can be anything up to 40,000 grey-headed flying foxes hanging in those trees. And as you go down into the valley and all around you are trees filled with flying foxes, it's hard to imagine that the whole place is surrounded by suburbia. For many years, people have thought of flying foxes simply as pests, and even people who like having them nearby can find the noise level disturbing. But with thousands of animals all living together in this colony, it's not surprising that they're noisy. The colony has a structure, with the mothers and their young finding protection in the centre. Around the edge of the group, there are guards who keep watch and raise the alarm if they're worried by an intruder. But this colony is facing a different sort of threat. Even though this colony has managed to survive where hundreds of others have simply perished, it doesn't mean it's without its problems. The very fact that the rim of this valley is enclosed by human habitation means that essentially the flying foxes are stuck here. They can't easily shift the colony to somewhere nearby, even if they wanted to. And that places pressure on what is a limited environment. Some of these trees that the flying foxes roost in have been killed off or damaged through overuse and being choked by weeds. And the problem's made worse because weeds have also stopped new trees from growing. But here, 
some of the locals are lending a hand. A lot of them want to make sure that the flying fox colony and its environment are safely preserved. So supporters of the Karingai Bat Colony Committee are trying to clear the weeds away and are planting new native trees. It gives the colony and the valley a better chance of survival. The flying foxes hang around here during the day, but this isn't where they eat. Finding the food they need means flying out of the valley each night and sometimes travelling as far as 20 or 30 kilometres away. have excellent eyesight and they're good navigators. This colony near the city uses the lights along major roadways as a sort of map they can follow to their favourite feeding spots. And some of the trees that provide their food are right in the city itself, so a regular meal can become a night out on the town. This is what's happened most often to flying foxes over the last century or so. They've been regarded basically as agricultural pests and hundreds of colonies have been destroyed. As people have cleared away the forests and planted fruit trees instead, flying foxes have often done a lot of damage to fruit crops. And the more their natural food's been removed, the more they've had to raid the orchards. Bob Patton and Ron Waddell have orchards that are less than 20 kilometres from our flying fox colony, and both of them have had a hard time. They've tried all sorts of methods to protect the fruit or scare off the flying foxes, but without a lot of success. Electrified wire, plastic netting, loud gas guns, even stroboscopic lights. In fact, the flashing lights just showed that flying foxes are fast learners. At first, they keep away. It's strange, but it's not strange for long. I, I thought we probably reduced the damage by 50 or 60 percent for a while. But in the end, I think we encouraged them. We were had a beacon going. <laughs> you, you told him there was a good feed down there yeah. with the flashing light. Yeah, the message got out. I mean, how much do you reckon you would have lost? Well, you're losing 70, 80 percent mm. of it, of your crop. So it's a lot of money. So, oh, yes. It's, mm. uh, we lost over 50 percent over those in about five nights. Just with flying foxes eating the fruit? Yeah. yeah. There should be a, a much more concerted effort, not just to save the fox, but to understand it and find ways of controlling it so that the production of food can go on alongside it. I don't, I'm not, as a lot of these people would have you believe, want to see all flying foxes eliminated. I just want them to stop eating my crop. <laughs> That's basic. <laughs> but flying foxes are now protected 
and National Parks and Wildlife has a responsibility to both orchardists and flying foxes. Oh, that's for sure. We're, uh, we're in the middle, but if you like, between the flying foxes and the growers. In the case of uh, some other animals that we're responsible for, like kangaroos, we have decades and decades of information that we can base our management on. In the case of the flying fox, there hasn't been much work done on it, on, on types of flying foxes and their ecology in recent years. And so we're, to some extent, starting from scratch, trying to manage a species, and that can be very difficult. Part of that push to find out more about flying foxes is the research being done at the University of New South Wales by Karen Parry-Jones. She's trying to work out the feeding range of Sydney's flying foxes and some of the ingredients of their diet. So how do you actually know what, uh, what they eat? Well, um, I collect the droppings and the uh, spat out material and mix it up with water and look at it under the microscope and see what I can identify. And uh, as I say, mostly the thing that keeps coming up is a lot of blossom, a bit of fig and uh, leaves, a bit of bark, strange things. So if there is this uh, range of natural food around, why do they go for orchards sometimes? Well, they really only come into fruit crops when there's no alternative. They, um, if there's anything else available, they'll eat it. The best place to explore the flying fox's habits in an undamaged environment is where they still have plenty of natural foods. This is the far north of Australia, the tropical home of the black flying fox. Here, there's a chance to see how the flying foxes live and breed without the pressures of nearby human beings and their cities. In March and April, it's time for mating. The males stake out a territory and then they mate with anything up to four females. Six months later, the young flying foxes are ready to be born. The birth happens in two stages. The head comes out first, but then everything stops for a while, anything up to five hours. Then it's the critical time. The rest of the baby emerges and has to be caught in its mother's wings. The nipples are underneath each wing, and the baby hangs on to one of them most of the time, even when it's not actually feeding. Flying foxes excrete while hanging from the claws on their wings. That way they don't make a mess of their fur. But whatever the mother's doing, resting or flying, the baby is carried around on her body for about four weeks, until eventually it gets too big and has to start fending for itself. As it begins to get dark, the black flying foxes head out in search of food, just like the grey-headed colony did in Sydney. But here, there's a different group of bats ready to take off into the night. These are little bent-winged bats, thousands of them, clinging to the roof of their cave. Even though it's dark and they are virtually flying blind in a small space, they don't bump into each other because, like most of the smaller bats, they use echolocation. The bats make high-pitched squeaks and then judge distances from the returning echo. A lot of people still associate bats with stories of black magic and vampires. Of course, it's just superstition, but it hasn't helped the public image of any of the bats. Of course, there is some truth in the Dracula connection. There are small vampire bats in South America, 
but they're generally more interested in nibbling the ankles of cattle than they are in biting the necks of humans. And they're also a part of an entirely different group of bats to the flying foxes. See, the bat world is divided into two broad groups. One is the usually small and usually carnivorous microcoroptera, like this Gould's wattled bat. Let's just put you somewhere comfortable out of the way. Now, the other group of bats is the megacoroptera, or flying foxes. And apart from the, the very obvious difference in size, there are also a lot of apparent similarities between the two types. The most obvious of it, of those similarities, is the way in which the finger and arm bones have been radically modified and covered in this soft, leathery skin to produce the very characteristic bat's wing. Now, apart from these similarities, there are also some very significant differences. Not too many bats catch animals as big as frogs, but this is a ghost bat, one of the largest of the microcoroptera. Its enormous ears and its strangely shaped nose are like radar dishes to help it track down its prey. On the other hand, flying foxes are vegetarians. They're not equipped for echolocation and they have to find their way around using their eyesight. When it comes to actually pinpointing food, they zero in through a good sense of smell. Because they fly such long distances and eat such a range of native blossoms and fruits, they've become important pollinators and seed spreaders. And that means they've got a vital place in the growth and the spread of forests. But Professor John Pettigrew of Queensland University suggests that those differences in behaviour and development are just one indication that bats and flying foxes are not closely related animals. His theory, and it's a controversial one, is that flying foxes are more closely linked to monkeys like these than they are to bats. He says that the evidence is there to call flying foxes flying primates. Now if they are primates, that would also put them on the same evolutionary limb as the apes. And it would mean that in evolutionary terms, flying foxes would be distant cousins of human beings. Well, there are a set of hallmarks of primates. There are a set of features which you have to define which primates have and that no other groups of mammals have. One of those features is having hands rather than paws. That means having an opposable thumb to get hold of objects. The flying fox has got an opposable thumb, but it just looks like a long hook on the front of its wing. However, it certainly uses those thumbs to hang on to things. But the most important factor, according to Professor Pettigrew, is the connection between the eyes and the brain. Primates have stereoscopic vision, and the images that come through the eyes are combined by a brain that's well developed. Flying foxes also have this sort of vision. So it's the eyes and the brain of the flying fox that give the strongest clue to that possible link with the primates. But have a look at this face. If you imagine it without the white fur, you can see the similarity to a flying fox. But this is a primate. It's a lemur. Professor Pettigrew believes that this is a close relative of the flying fox that flying foxes are not in fact bats at all, but flying lemurs. He's convinced he's right, but not everybody else is. I think that uh, there's a problem when you have such an in, in intense emotion surrounding 
a viewpoint which is a 80 or 90 years old that puts uh, these fellows with the regular bats. And I think it's going to take quite a bit of doing to convince people that these fellows are actually quite close to us. However intelligent they are, there are some things they have to be taught. Come on, come on, over here. Flap your wings. Spread them out. Come on, flap. A big flap. Come on. You're supposed to be learning to fly. Come on, get your wings up. Come on. That's it, that's right. Spread them out. Come on, up here. Archie, come on. Come on, get your wings up. But don't just spread them. Come on, out. That's it. Out. Out. I know it's the first time. Come on. Yep, come on. First flight. How did it feel? These are all foster parents who've shared similar experiences with their orphans. But now it's time to say goodbye. When I was first introduced to bats, I thought they were really scary things. But looking after one, I just feel so comfortable with them. They're really friendly little things, and the kids just love having them around. Julie's Roger is actually much, much bigger than those two. They're so much fun to have. They almost treat you like you're their mother. And in the mornings, my wife would get up and uh, be standing in the kitchen sink and call to him in another room, and he'd, he'd answer with a chirp, you know, so say, I'm awake, where's breakfast? They're quite different to any other animal. But it's a total joy. They are a unique experience. But you grow to love them, don't you? You really do grow to love them. No, I, I'll miss him when he goes. How old is She was 12 days old. 430. The final job for us foster parents is to have the babies weighed and measured to check on how well they've grown. Then a band is put on their thumb claw for identification in case they're found again sometime after their release. The whole point of fostering these flying foxes wasn't to make pets of them, but to give them the best possible chance of getting back to their natural environment. They may be going into a small cage now, but it's a big step towards complete freedom. First of all, though, they've got to learn that they are flying foxes, even though they've been brought up by humans, so they've got to spend time with their own kind. These large cages are close to the colony, and there are nighttime visits by wild flying foxes. Eventually, the cage doors are left open and the young ones go off exploring with their visitors. If everything goes well, they join the colony and they don't come back. The future for all flying foxes may be helped by having some influential allies. Uh, is the, the flying fox, uh, and uh, I have a, a friendly flying fox with me at the moment. Happen to have a flying, flying fox, fox handy. <laughs> handy here. I mean, this is one of the one of the animals which has been most persecuted in the in the whole of Australian history. Yet it's probably Australia's most intelligent animal. How do we persuade people that an animal like that is a really important thing to preserve? Well, I think the first in the first case that you actually, if you see an animal like this, hello. 
the more you learn, learn about animals, the more you get to know them, uh, the better you feel about them. And there are some people that will always have uh, a bit of a horror about these sort of things. And it is strange, but the more you know about them, the more you see them, the more perhaps they appear on television, the more people will feel attracted towards them, I hope, anyway. There are also those the flying fox has a more developed brain than domestic pets like dogs or cats and it may be Australia's most intelligent native animal. But the important thing is to recognise it as a valuable part of the Australian environment and give it a better deal than it's had in the past. And tomorrow, Animal Passions explores the dead heart in Australia. Music on BBC Two. Music on BBC Two. Hello, good afternoon, welcome to Children's BBC Two. Everyone's favourite part of the afternoon this is. We not, might not be here for long, but it's absolutely fab and groovy when we are. Now, an update on our Noddy and Big Ears competition, which we're judging this week. This is fabulous, look at this. And even Noddy's bell rings. Oh, isn't that fantastic? Thank you, Joshua Smith from Ipswich in Suffolk. We like that one. Even a nice furry beard there on Big Ears and some hair on Noddy as well. Excellent, great, great, great effects there. This has been done using stickers. Thank you, Aisha from Southall in Middlesex. And there's Noddy and Big Ears in the little car. So many pictures and so little time to show them in. I've got another one here, have a look at this. Here's Big Ears arriving in a big balloon. Thank you very much, Emily. Well, now it's time for the brollies. Rainbows climb, clouds drift by, brollies fly through a magic sky. Is it real? Are they dreams? Nothing appears to be what it seems. Then far away I can hear a voice in the weather house call out a name. Mr. Brolly, it's time for the rain. was trying to go to sleep, but no sooner had he closed his eyes than he opened them again. Tucked up beside Harry in bed were his toys, Elephant and Hippo. 
Snake, as always, lay on the rug by the door, and Bird was perched on the chest of drawers. Harry stared down at his patchwork quilt. It was different from other quilts. Instead of flowery scraps of material, it was made of little embroidered pictures of rainbows, stars and planets, clouds, and great flashes of lightning in a dark and stormy sky. It had been made a long, long time ago. On the wall hung Harry's weather house. If the day was going to be fine and sunny, Mrs. Brolly came to her door. If the day was going to be wet and cloudy, Mr. Brolly came out. But of course, they never came out together, for it is impossible for a day to be both wet and dry at the same time. But what would happen if they both came out together? wondered Harry, and he sat up and stared at the weather house. As he stared, the doors seemed to grow larger. His bed grew smaller, and he found himself at the entrance of the weather house. A light was shining from the door through which Harry could see Mr. Brolly no longer fixed to his wooden stand, but moving freely about the room. When Harry entered the weather house, he found Mr. Brolly standing behind a curious machine. It had been made a long time ago. Mr. Brolly, what a wonderful old machine, said Harry. What does it do? One moment, my boy, one moment, he said. I almost have it. Just a tinkering with a screw here and a tightening of a spring there and... <coughs> the machine coughed, rumbled and then fell silent. Mr. Brolly, what are you doing? Well, Harry, I'm trying to make a special surprise for Mrs. Brolly's birthday and I suddenly remembered the old weather machine. My grandpa made it a long time ago. It never got the weather quite right, but it made some delightful singing rainbows. Singing rainbows, said Harry. How lovely they must have been. Oh, I, I never actually made one, said Mr. Brolly. I could never understand the instructions for doing so. Oh, imagine the joy, he said of being able to go outside and to point upwards and say, Dearest, this is for you. And there would be a singing rainbow arching across the sky. Perhaps I could help you to mend it, said Harry. Perhaps you could, dear boy, he said. Children have sharp eyes and nimble little fingers. Little Cloud drifted into the room. As he entered, the lamp on the machine lit up and a large black cloud came out of the chimney. It was playing a very loud march. Oh, catch it, my boy, cried Mr. Brolly. I can't present Mrs. Brolly with a loud black cloud for her birthday. Biggle, cried the little cloud happily. He felt sure that the big cloud was his grandpa. Still playing the loud march, the big cloud floated from the window. Little cloud followed. Bumpa! he cried. Mrs. Brolly was sitting on the porch step with Wilkins. They were both surprised when the big black cloud and little cloud rained down on them. Brolly? said Mrs. Brolly, 